In chapter 17, we'll look at mid-latitude climates, mostly focusing on the United States to keep it more simple. We'll look at the mid-latitude circulation in winter versus summer, the different climate types, including wet climates, west coast climates, winter dry climates, summer dry climates, and deserts, and look at the mechanisms that are causing these different types of climates. The big difference here in the mid-latitudes as we move away from the tropics is larger seasonal than diurnal fluctuations in temperature. Here we're looking at the seasonal fluctuation in temperature, overhead sun, long days in July, warm temperatures, short days, less intense sun in winter, etc. as you go throughout the yearly cycle. One of the key players here in the mid-latitudes is the jet stream. The variations in surface temperature gradients worldwide help make the jet wavy, and the waves in the jet themselves help spin up storms. We found that the jet moves south in winter following the maximum temperature gradient. The temperature gradient in the winter is pretty strong, so the jet stream is pretty strong as a result. As it has some curvature in it, you can generate highs and lows at the surface. These will drag cold surface air south and drag warm surface air north, causing frontal precipitation in these zones. When it moves to the north following the temperature gradient in the summer, it does the same thing. You'll get your maximum frontal precipitation leave the center of the U.S. and head to the border or even into Canada during that time. South of the jet stream, you can typically have thunderstorms during the summer. However, the frontal precip is evacuated. So there's a pronounced difference in daylight in summer versus winter as one moves north. First of all, the intensity of the sun is stronger in the summer, and also the days are longer. And in the winter, the sun is coming in at an angle, and it's less intense, and the days are shorter. Both of those processes feed into having a high temperature range over the course of the year as a result of changes in the solar angle and day length. So in the summer, you have an intense sun, long days, less frontal precipitation in the central U.S. because the jet stream is to our north at that time, but you will get more thunderstorms because you have plenty of moisture typically at that time and plenty of surface heating to fire them off. In the winter, the sun's weaker, the days are shorter, you're going to have less thunderstorms or even no thunderstorms in most of the U.S., and more frontal precipitation because the jet's directly overhead at that time. In general, temperature is a function of latitude for the mid-lats. Many exceptions, however, here in Boulder, where we get some winter warmth with downsloping winds. So here we're just looking at a graph of latitude in the x-axis, increasing to the left, temperature increasing upwards, and so it basically just shows as you head more south, the temperature increases. This is the annual average precipitation for the United States. So the salient features you can see here, the precipitation tends to decrease as you move from the maritime tropical air mass, and that would be mostly from the Gulf of Mexico down here, with the exception along the northwest coast that gets maritime polar air masses hitting the mountains quite often. So in general, you can see this is pretty wet here. The greens are 40 to 60 inches of precipitation per year. As you head to the west, you're getting further and further from the Gulf of Mexico moisture. You're drying out considerably. Up here in the Pacific Northwest, again, you have plenty of maritime polar air coming in here, so very moist, and a lot of mountains up here, including the Cascade Mountains here, to help wring out that moisture. But they also have plenty of fronts as well, so the jet stream tends to reside up here both summer and winter, so they can have jet-driven storms any time of year as a result. As you go into the mountainous interior, you're mostly looking at an orographic effect where the high mountains are capturing more precipitation than the low valleys, and you're looking at a lot of rain shadows. These mountains basically rob a lot of Pacific moisture and take it in the Sierras and on the coastal mountains before it can get into these interior deserts. As a reminder, with some of these letters, A is tropical climate, and we don't see those until you go off the page here. BW means a desert climate, typically less than 10 inches of rain per year. BS means a semi-dry climate, typically 10 to 20 inches per year. C means it's mild all year. D is a severe winter. And then you get into the small letters, the second letters. So small f means every month you get decent precipitation. S means the summer tends to be drier. W means the winter tends to be drier. And then the third letter gets into differentiating the summers typically. So A would be in a hot summer, that would involve any place down in the southeast down here. B would be a warm summer, meaning places like Chicago. C would be a cool summer, places further north into Canada. And K means there's a decent change in temperature, typical of a mid-latitude environment over time. And H means it's a low-latitude environment with less change in temperature over time. Looking into some of these climates and the mechanisms, 
The zone in the Pacific Northwest, the C again means mild relatively all year. The F means all wet, all wet over the course of the year. The B means a relatively warm summer, but not hot summer. The mechanism here is that they have moisture all the time coming in from the Pacific. They have fronts that can converge that moisture and force precipitation. And they also have mountains that can orographically create rainfall as well. So they're typically wet all throughout the year. And as a result of the moderating effects of the ocean, their temperature is pretty consistent over time as well. As you go further into California, you get these CSA climates a little bit inland of the coast, and then CSB climates right along the coast. And again, the A means a hot summer, the B means a warm summer, and the big C means generally mild all year, and the S means the summer tends to be dry. So what happens there is that the cold water offshore stops summer precip. They have almost no thunderstorms in this zone, so they can't get precip firing off in the summer because that cold water suppresses convection. However, during their winter, why the winter is not dry, is because the jet stream sags far enough and the associated fronts to clip them with jet-driven storms during the winter. As you go even further south than that, you're getting too far. You're not getting the jet stream in the winter. You're also having cold water suppressing convection or thunderstorms during the summer, so you get into a desert zone, the Baja deserts here, where you just don't have a mechanism for precipitation. As you move into the mountainous interior, you're tending to get mostly rain shadow effects or just blockage of vapor, water vapor from the Pacific, and also it's too far to come from the Gulf of Mexico. So they're basically continental in nature, but also there's rain shadows that create these dry zones here. So for the southeast, you have CFA, which means mild all year, rainy all year, hot summers. Why? Because the Gulf of Mexico is right here, you have a lot of moisture, you have plenty of precip for summertime thunderstorms, the jet traverses across the country in the winter, they get plenty of jet-driven precip in the winter, and they have a lot of heat keeping them mild all year because of the sun during the summer, and because the Gulf of Mexico stays warm throughout the winter, providing them warmth as well. As you get north of there, you get your DFB and DFA climates. D again means a severe winter, and this is because they're farther away from the oceanic sources of, of heat during the winter. So the winter gets severe. They're also affected by plunges of air coming down from Canada, cold air intrusions. The F again means wet all year. So they do get thunderstorms during the summer. They get enough moisture to produce thunderstorms and they get jet driven storms during the winter. And the only major difference at this scale between say North Dakota and further into Southern Illinois and such is that the summer is quite a bit hotter as you move to the south. So thinking about this, this battle zone in the Great Plains, you have a lot of times the jet stream coming in, creating extratropical cyclones, forcing warm air, moist air to come up from the south, cold, dry air to come up from the north, and they collide, producing jet-driven storms. Question, how would this area's climate change if there was a west-east mountain range there, say from Boulder east to the Atlantic? Would it be more moist to the south? Would it be much drier to the north? Would it be colder to the north in winter? Would the jet perhaps be less wavy or would it be all of the above? The best guess here would be all of the above. Certainly this is kind of the scenario in the Himalayas in the Asian continent here in that you have a big cluster of mountains. And if you had a big cluster of mountains here, that would certainly help keep cold in this zone to the north of those mountains. In other words, they wouldn't be able to get the moderating effects from the Gulf of Mexico or that warmth or moisture invective that way. So you'd make this area to the north of the mountains more continental, colder, less moisture as a result. And then south of the mountains, you'd probably have orographic precipitation as that Gulf of Mexico moisture is forced to ride up those mountains and precipitate to the south. For the jet stream, you might think it might be less wavy in this scenario since these mountains are going to force the temperature gradient to stay still, separating cold air to the north from warmer air to the south. And as a result, since jets form above the maximum temperature gradient, you may conclude that the jet will be less wavy since the temperature gradient is less wavy. Looking at some of these climate zones, first the mid-latitude wet region. Here's Chicago with a cold winter, no dry season, hot summer. You can see a large temperature range with a red curve. You see every month throughout the year they have good, decent amount of precipitation. They get moisture in jet driven storms in winter and thunderstorms in summer, sometimes severe since they also have the jet close enough to give the wind shear for those more strong storms. Now looking at marine west coast wet climates where they have a consistent and moist west wind. Greenwich, England, mild and wet throughout with a warm summer. 
a reduced temperature range compared to a lot of mid-latitude zones that are more continental because the ocean doesn't change its temperature that much over the course of the year. You can see they have consistent rains, although not nearly as much as, say, Sitka, Alaska, which is another west coast wet climate. Mid-latitude summer dry climates, also known as Mediterranean climates, cold waters offshore in summer promote high pressure and limit convection. The jet moves more overhead in the winter in these zones, giving you frontal precipitation, which is why their winter is not dry too. The temperature range will depend on these climates on how directly downwind from the ocean you are. The closer you are to the ocean, the more your climate is like the ocean itself, the less you'll have a temperature change over time. This graph looks at the latitudinal variation in annual precip in the summer dry climate. So essentially they're looking along the west coast of the US and seeing why as you move further north you get more precipitation. The reason why is as you move further north you're getting more into the westerly wind belt out of the subtropics so you're gonna have more strong westerly winds forcing precipitation whether it's orographic or not and you also have more time with the jet stream the further north you are because the jet stream is typically further north on average than Los Angeles. So San Diego Los Angeles get a little precip in the winter because they get brushed by the jet stream but San Francisco and Portland have more precip because they have spend more time with the jet stream they get more jet driven storms in general. Mid-latitude winter dry climates there's not a great example of this in the US so I'll use this zone in China instead that has a cold winter, winter dry, and a hot summer. And they're, even though they're on the coast here, the east coast of Asia, they actually are fairly continental because most of the winds are coming off the continent from the west. And you can see that with their large temperature range over time. You would not have this on the west coast of any continent because you'd have west winds blowing in the temperature that relates to the oceanic temperature change. But here, this large temperature range definitely tells you that most of the air is coming off the continent dictating their climate. During the winter, the jet's not near them to give them jet-driven storm. During the summer, the land starts to heat up, drawing in moisture off the coast here, giving them kind of a sea breeze effect or a monsoonal flow that gives them summertime precipitation. A great many places in the central U.S. and elsewhere are basically winter drier. They're not considered completely winter dry in the Köppen scheme. However, if you look at the pattern, the summertime thunderstorms deliver more precip than the wintertime jet-driven storms. What the mechanism is here, away from the ocean, the moisture infiltrates slowly and builds in the spring and summer. So the vapor pressure, the dew points go up during the spring and summer. Once the surface starts to heat from the intense sun, it destabilizes the atmosphere and starts to give you these very wet thunderstorms. For the contiguous U.S., you generally must be next to a body of water or be a mountain to get more precip in winter. So those zones along California, they get more precip in winter because the summertime convection is suppressed by that cold water. Or in a mountain, you can get certainly a lot of orographic precipitation during the winter time to overwhelm whatever precipitation you do get during the summer. In the Great Plains, however, those summertime thunderstorms give you a lot of moisture and typically more than the jet-driven storms do. This is important for agriculture because you're getting the precipitation when you need it when you're growing your plants. So I just want to show you one dynamic that feeds into giving the Great Plains that copious moisture during the growing season in their summer. And this is what's called a low-level jet. So we have Boulder here, the Great Plains here, rising up as you go to the west, and Kansas closer down towards sea level. Which climate is more dry? Well, just looking at our maps, we saw that Kansas has a lot more precip, a lot more soil moisture, and Boulder's more high and dry of a climate, so Boulder's drier. So which would cool faster at night as a result? Well, you could expect in the dry climate, Boulder, you'd have less clouds in general and also less water vapor in the air. Water vapor being a greenhouse gas would allow more cooling overnight from IR radiation. So Boulder will cool more effectively overnight than Kansas would as a result of less water vapor and less clouds. Since we cool off better at night than Kansas, we get a cold anomaly. Since Boulder has a cold anomaly at night compared to Kansas, that means all the molecules get colder and they're moving more slowly, they pack down into a smaller place. This effect, looking at past lectures, is to make any of the pressure surfaces overhead depress downward, go to lower heights than they would over the warm anomaly. So just looking at the 850 millibar pressure level, it would depress towards the colder zone, Boulder. So if you took a cut at a constant height across that from Boulder to Kansas, you would find a pressure gradient force going from 
over here in Kansas, where it's greater than 850 millibars of pressure at this constant height, to over here in Boulder, where it's less than 850 millibars at a constant height. So there's a pressure gradient force somewhere at a level around 850 millibars directed from Kansas towards Boulder. Of course, as an air parcel gets accelerated from Kansas aloft at 850 millibars towards Boulder, the Coriolis force will turn it to its right until there's a balance with a jet heading directly into the screen here from south to north towards Minnesota, let's say. The effect of what this low-level or nocturnal low-level jet is to scoop up Gulf of Mexico moisture overnight and feed it into the Great Plains so that you might fire off some thunderstorms the next day. There's other mechanisms to make these low-level jets, specifically extratropical cyclones that form east of the Rockies. So we found that a lot of these form east of the Rockies. They can produce these low-level jets too. West of the cyclone, cold air is pinned against the eastern Rockies. So cold air masses are tend to be shallow and dense. They'll get trapped against the eastern Rockies, making a cold anomaly in Boulder again. East of the cyclone, warm air is getting pulled up from the Gulf of Mexico. So you have a warm anomaly, say, over Kansas. This produces that same pressure gradient at 850 millibars directed from Kansas towards Boulder. And again, a jet starts driving air directly from south to north. As shown in this map here, here's a nice set of high winds associated with one of these events at 850 millibars, and you can see that it's taking Gulf of Mexico moisture and just loading it into the Great Plains. So then all you have to do to set the table for precipitation is warm the surface, which is pretty easy during the summertime, and then you get thunderstorms. So these are just part of the reasons why the Great Plains are really a good place to grow crops. Looking now at Denver's climate, the mid-latitude steppe for semi-dry climates, Big continental effect, we're not near the moderating effect of the ocean, so we have a decent temperature range. We have more rain in the spring and summer season when we have more moisture and decreased stability from a warming surface. In the winter time, we have strong west winds coming in from the winter when the increasing jet. However, since the mountains are forcing this air to compress as it comes down slope into Denver and Boulder, it tends to dry it out, so winter time we don't get as much moisture as the spring and summer. Mid-latitude desert climates, they're dry all year with a very large temperature range. There's no clouds or water vapor to keep the nighttime warm or the daytime cool. Lovelock, Nevada is a good example. The Sierras simply rob their water vapor. This area in China that's on the lee side of the Himalayas, Asia actually has the most mid-latitude deserts because of the huge size of the continent. You're able to be pretty continental anywhere in here because it's a long distance to ocean. Plus they have that Himalaya range that runs west to east and that blocks the Indian Ocean moisture. So in effect, the Atlantic moisture can't make it there. It's just too many thousands of miles before it gets there. And the Indian Ocean moisture can't get there either because the Himalayas are in the way. We have on that north side of the Himalayas a lot of mid-latitude deserts. Again, the mid-latitude part of it is just the fact that they have a large temperature swing as a result of their latitudinal position. So in summary, we looked at the mid-lat circulation. Jet stream forms above where cold and warm air masses meet. The jet stream can spin up large-scale storms while thunderstorms occur mainly south of the jet. So the distribution and precipitation here depends on if the jet's over here during the winter, you're going to get jet-driven storms and some precip. However, for summertime precip in many of these zones, especially along the U.S., you need to have moisture infiltrating, but you also need some surface heating to cause instability. The places where that did not happen was along the California coast because the cold water suppressed convection. So looking at these zones, mid-lad wet climates east to southeast of the Rockies, essentially these Great Plains zones, close to the Gulf of Mexico and no mountains. So they get the jet stream plus thunder, so they're wet all year round. Marine west coast climates, very moist westerly winds provide rain, keep temps pretty consistent throughout the year as well. And they also have as you go further north along the coast of California and Oregon and Washington, you're getting more jet driven storms on average than the places further south. The mid-latitude winter dry climates, most of the interior Great Plains states have drier winters than summers. However, the winters aren't dry enough to classify them in the Köppen scheme as winter dry. But I will say those summertime thunderstorms do give more moisture typically than the jet driven storms on the annual average. Winter dry is common in many subtropical islands. It 
it's very much related to the Hadley cell, where the ITCZ migrates away from the islands during the summertime, and these places are high and dry in the descending branch of the Hadley cell during the winter, and this is often why people in the mid-latitudes during the harsh winter will migrate to these subtropical islands because the winter time there is pretty mild. Mid-latitude summer dry climates, cold water offshore, California especially suppresses summertime convection. The jet, however, will brush them in winter, providing their meager precip during the winter time. The mid-lat deserts, you have really two types, the coastal deserts like Baja, where cold water offshore suppresses summer convection, and Baja is just too far to the south to get any jet effects even during the winter. The inland deserts are typically just surrounded by mountains that are blocking any sources of moisture from getting in there or wringing out the moisture before it gets there, and also the air is forced to descend in these deserts which provides warmth by compression, reducing the relative humidity. 